With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, there's new funding for the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. We'll have more on that. But to start the day today, earlier this summer, two big price changes occurred in the corn and soybean markets. Combined, they have a carry in the market. Todd Gleason has more on how to capture that carry. Here are the two important items as outlined on the University of Illinois Farm Doc Daily website. First, price levels declined beginning in June and continuing to the present. New crop corn and soybean futures for delivery during the upcoming fall harvest period for both fell by about 20%. The second big change this summer came in the deferred contracts, or those tied to delivery in early 2025, says Joe Jansen from the University of Illinois. So obviously the one that I think everyone who follows grain markets is aware is that prices are lower than they were back in May and June. Um, that's, the, that's the first one. But the second thing, and what tends to happen when we go move into a lower price environment, is the market tends to reward uh, people for, for storing grain. It ups the incentive to kind of hold some grain back because the market's well supplied in the short run. Uh, so what, how it does that is by widening out or increasing the spread between delivery at different dates. So think about delivery and next March relative to delivery now at harvest, for example. That, those spreads have widened out significantly um, in, the last, in the last three to four months. Uh, both for corn and for soybeans. The second big change over this same summertime period was the increase in calendar spreads, or the difference between the price for delivery in early 2025 to the fall 2024 harvest time price. The spreads are really there to just kind of tell you, you know, what's the trade-off between bringing grain to the market today, what could you get for that relative to holding it back and st and waiting, selling it later? Um, and the market is saying, you know, we expect that, you know, there's a little bit more reward now for, for holding grain back because the market is well supplied. We need to incentivize a little bit more storage going forward through the marketing year to kind of spread that supply out. Again, the Illinois Ag Economist says the explanation for lower prices and larger spreads is straightforward. If the market will be adequately supplied in the near term, then spreads must rise so futures markets may perform one of the principal functions, allocating grain that is abundant now to post-harvest time periods where it is less so by incentivizing enough storage. The spread is commonly called the carry, since it represents the return to the act of carrying or storing the grain over time. The simple version of capturing the carry is to sell the crop in the cash market today for delivery at a future date. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Is the world awash with cotton? Here's Gary Crawford. U.S. cotton growers, you have certainly outdone yourselves this season. We're looking at a U.S. crop of about 14.5 million bales, and that's about up almost 2.5 million bales from last year. A 20% bigger crop, which USDA Outlook Chairman Mark Chekanowski says is a little worrisome. It's an interesting crop because it's uh, really driven by uh, uh, general economic conditions, consumer demand, and, and, and the overall outlook for the uh, U.S. and global economy, and there's so there's been some concerns about uh, cotton demand and cotton consumption, and that's been weighing on prices. USDA is forecasting the season average farm price for cotton to be only 66 cents a pound, down 13 percent from last year. So again, that's reflecting both those larger U.S. supplies and some concerns about cotton demand. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In other news, USDA has revised its corn and soybean forecasts. We go back to Gary Crawford once again. The biggest U.S. soybean crop in history, the second biggest corn crop. That's what the USDA is currently projecting. On the corn side, the USDA says evaluations of crops in the fields and farmer surveys all point to a pretty big crop, 15.2 billion bushels. That would be up less than 1% from USDA's previous forecast, down uh, about a percent from last year's corn production. Several states are reporting their highest yields on record. USDA puts the average national yield at 183.6 bushels an acre, 6.3 better 
than last year. For soybeans, USDA is forecasting the largest bean crop ever, just under 4.6 billion bushels, up 10% from last season. USDA says based on current conditions, yields could average 53.2 bushels an acre, up about 2.5 bushels from this past year. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You're listening to the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Here is Rod Bain with today's National Spotlight. Building capacity, infrastructure, and demand. All aspects of a USDA grant program centered on organic ag growers and the organic industry. We're excited to announce our fourth and final round of the Organic Market Development Grants. This is $9.8 million in funding for 14 projects in nine states. The recent announcement by Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs, Jenny Moffitt, regarding total funding from the Organic Market Development Grant Award over its four rounds. This will bring the total for the awards to $85 million in 36 states across the nation, as well as the District of Columbia. We've been making these announcements over the course of the past months, announcing our first round in January. In terms of the intent of this program, the Organic Market Development Grant Program is really about supporting the development and expansion of new and existing markets to help increase consumption of domestic organic products, but also for organic producers to have a really critical an important value chain. Some examples regarding improving organic market value chains include increasing the supply for domestic producers, handlers, processors, everyone throughout the supply chain, facilitating market development, removing barriers for entry to organic certification for small producers, expanding capacity for processing, aggregation, distribution, storage of products, supporting and promotional activities. The grants also focus on organic sector projects addressing specific pinpointed market needs in categories such as organic grains and livestock feed and organic dairy. For instance, a coalition of producers out in Colorado called the Colorado Grain Chain. They're looking at the whole supply chain of grains in Colorado and the value add production and opportunity for grain producers and what that will mean for increasing the organic grain supply in the state. So things like distillers and bakers and all of these other different ways in which grain producers can sell to higher value markets. The grant program is part of USDA's Organic Transition Initiative. More information about OTI is available online at www.farmers.gov slash organic dash transition dash initiative. When the global COVID-19 pandemic was at its high alert point in 2020 and 21, one non-health related concern arose when supply chains were disrupted. You might remember some food items and ingredients meant for grocery stores, retailers, and restaurants were not available as a result. It was a time when industries and businesses became creative in their distribution methods whenever possible. As an example, we learned during the pandemic that when restaurants and institutions shut down, everybody pivoted to the grocery stores, and we were able to put about 50 million four-pound bags of sugar on the shelf. So there was never a shortage of sugar during the pandemic. Yet according to Luther Marquardt of the American Sugar Alliance, distribution challenges did occasionally arise during the pandemic. Any little hiccups typically are a transportation issue. It's getting truck drivers or getting the rail cars on time. Those are the little glitches that we found during COVID. But all the time, we're in very good shape to take care of our customers. He credits the ability to distribute sugar during the global COVID outbreak to a ground level producer-led system. We all work very close together. In fact, all the sugar beet factories in the United States are owned by the farmers. We have a very good tight supply chain. Everybody needs to make sure that they succeed. It's very much the same way with the cane and cane refiners. Most of the cane refiners are owned by sugar cane farmers. So we have a very efficient, a very motivated supply chain within our industry, and we want to make sure we get our product to the customers. In addition, we've got 90 distribution facilities facilities strategically located all over the United States and if something happens with one producer or another we can step in and fill in and take care of the American consumer. But what about going forward regarding supply chain and distribution improvements for our nation's sugar industry? Mark Hard says while the basic product of sugar whether cane or beet processed never changes 
the focus shifts to making both the production and distribution of sugar more efficient. What changes is how we produce it. We've got technologies all in our seed and our fertilizers, all kinds of things that would blow people's minds of how technical it is to be a sustainable, efficient producer of our product. And there's lots of things coming in the pipeline. That's today's National Spotlight. Now here's John Harris with the Livestock Report. A team of 21 farmers and farm group representatives traveled to Japan as the Heartland team to see firsthand the promotion of U.S. beef and pork in the region by the U.S. Meat Export Federation. The utilization of beef tongue in Japan made an impression on the group, as Nebraska cattleman Mark Goes explains. Tongue product is everywhere, right down to tongue-flavored pretzels. And so the Japan imports a tremendous amount of tongue from the United States, and they have learned to utilize it to where it's favored over ribeye steak for them. The tongue is a standard and a staple for them here. And so it, uh, I knew of that issue before, but to see it firsthand and the magnitude with which it's, it's put in, in, ingrained into the society, it's just incredible. The Japanese market values quality over price, a characteristic that sets the standard for U.S. pork production, according to Missouri pork producer Jesse Heimer. Relative to quality, Japan actually sets the standard uh, in the United States. The quality standard at every plant uh, is based on the color expectation that the Japanese customer wants. And believe it or not, our highest quality pork loins, uh, much of our highest quality pork ends up in this market here in Japan. And that expectation for quality is the standard uh, in our country for export. And the opportunity to be face to face, hand to hand with our customer here in Japan, uh, the consumer, uh, the Japanese consumer that really appreciates our product, appreciates American pork. Uh, it was a great opportunity to see that relationship firsthand and to understand that probably wouldn't be possible without our partnership with MEF. That's why it's important to bring producers to markets like Japan to share how U.S. product is raised, according to U.S. MEF President and CEO Dan Hallstrom. We have to continue to tell that story about quality and how we're different. And I think uh, having producers here in the marketplace uh, seeing the importance of that is uh, that's worth the, the, the value of the trip itself. For more, please visit USMEF.org. For the U.S. Meat Export Federation, I'm John Harris. This is the Agonet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with a preview of what you'll hear today on Agnet West, here's Brian German. A research project seeks to improve carrots' resistance to challenging conditions like water shortages and disease. The project, funded by a half a million dollar grant from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research and an additional half million dollars from other industry partners, is being led by researchers from UC Davis and the USDA. The team is focusing on wild carrots and their ability to thrive under water-deficient conditions and resist alternaria. The researchers are screening various wild carrot types to identify the ones with the best traits. Once they identify the most promising wild carrots, they will crossbreed them with cultivated carrots to introduce these beneficial traits into commercial varieties. The team's also studying the genetic basis of these traits to ensure they can be effectively passed on to future generations of carrots. The improved carrot seeds and breeding methods developed from the research will be shared with major seed companies and crop breeders. The USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture is investing $17.6 million to fund research aimed at protecting the health and welfare of farm animals. The investment includes tackling major diseases like bird flu and African swine fever, which pose serious threats to both animal health and the food supply. Out of the total, $12.7 million will go towards 27 projects focused on animal health, including vaccine research. Some projects aim to develop vaccines for diseases like bird flu and ASF, which could help prevent outbreaks that threaten livestock industries. An additional $4.8 million will support 10 projects focused on improving animal welfare, such as breeding heat-tolerant poultry to adapt to climate change and improving the welfare of dairy calves through better early life management. This research is part of USDA's efforts to ensure a safer, more sustainable food system by addressing the health of animals, people, and the environment. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has announced new funding for its Agricultural Conservation Easement Program for 2025. The program helps landowners protect and restore wetlands, farmlands, and grasslands, which are important for capturing carbon and providing other environmental benefits. Landowners and producers interested in conservation can apply for funding to the program's two types of easements, agricultural land easements and wetland reserve easements. Priority is given to protecting grasslands at risk of being developed and farmlands under threat. 
USDA is streamlining the application process to make it easier. Applications are accepted year-round, but two key deadlines are October 4th and December 20th for 2025 funding. The program aims to support conservation efforts while also benefiting disadvantaged communities through the Justice 40 initiative. Addressing labor issues with new technologies can be a complicated process. Senior Vice President of Innovation at Western Growers, Walt Duflock, described some of their industry resources that will be highlighted at this year's FIRA USA event. We've got an economic template these growers will be able to use, and we've got a WG Assist module that we're building and staffing out for, where you'll be able to pay Western Growers to put somebody in a chair at your operation for a couple of weeks so that we can help you do the math, because the Excel spreadsheet's pretty easy to build. Now it's a matter of sourcing out the data in your operation so you know exactly what you're paying for labor and exactly what it's being used for, weeding, thinning, harvesting, etc. And then you can work against the right set of math because it turns out no matter what size the operation is, it takes hours and hours to pull this data out, get it baselined, and then compare it to the robot that's now coming in to help relieve some of the pressure on that labor. UC Cooperative Extension and Cal Poly are hosting the Central Coast Rangeland Coalition Fall Workshop next month in San Luis Obispo. The Rangeland Restoration and Improvement Workshop will take place on Thursday, October 17th at the Cal Poly Beef Center beginning at 8.30 in the morning. The event will include a panel discussion going over the benefits and constraints of the Rangeland Restoration and Improvement process, which will feature personnel from Swanton Pacific Ranch, San Benito Resource Conservation District, and Cal Poly. There will also be a presentation highlighting funding and collaboration opportunities and information sources. Field site visits will include a look at livestock productivity and road improvement projects at Escuela Ranch, along with a look at the Walter Creek Riparian Restoration Project. More information about the workshop is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. An update from the G20 Agricultural Ministers Meeting. That's coming up on this line of ours. Deputy Agriculture Secretary Social Torres Small gives us some highlights from the G20 Agricultural Ministers Meeting held in Brazil over the weekend. The theme of this year's meeting is building a just world and a sustainable planet. And it's focused on various pillars, which include improving the sustainability and resilience of agriculture and food systems, and particularly through agricultural productivity, growth, and innovation. Another goal was enhancing international trade, which is fundamental to expand markets at home, as well as to global food security. Making food systems more inclusive by expanding opportunities for small-scale farmers, women, youth, indigenous people, and other underrepresented groups. And during the course of the meeting, I had the chance to share more with my counterparts about how USDA is fostering more resilient local and regional food production, ensuring access to safe, healthy, and nutritious food. You are listening to the Agonet News Hour. Here is Chuck Zimmerman. At the Farm Progress Show, I'm visiting with the Clean Fuels uh, Alliance booth, but I have with me some uh, special guests from PepsiCo, and uh, I have two guys here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Adam. Thank you, Chuck. My name is Adam Buchenbach. I lead the fleet engineering sustainability teams for North America for PepsiCo Foods and PepsiCo Beverages. And how about you? Yeah, I'm Dan Christensen with PepsiCo. I'm in my ninth year with the company, uh, Senior Director for Government and External Affairs. So I wear a couple different hats, and the hat I'm here wearing today is getting out and talking with a lot of constituencies in the ag value chain about what we're doing to support farmers. Well, um, talking about that, since we are at Farm Progress Show, what, what brought you here uh, along with the Clean Fuels folks? Yeah. I mean, it's the largest outdoor trade show for ag in the world. And so this was a venue that we've been thinking about for quite some time to get in front of farmers and talk about what we're doing. And the partnership with Clean Fuels made a ton of sense because we're new members. And so, you know, we got together with them and said, hey, are you thinking about going there? We'd love to go in on a lot with you. And so it was a great chance for us to come here, talk about the biodiesel work that we're doing in our fleet, also talk about a lot of the on-farm sustainability work that we're doing in partnership with our other value chain partners. Well, I did want to talk about that with your uh, fleet is, you know, what what drew you to that? Uh, what's the extent of it? And what does it mean for Pe PepsiCo? Yeah, absolutely. So let me start back in 2021. We launched PepsiCo Positive, which is really our strategic transformation of what we think is going to help create value and growth in the future. And it follows three pillars, positive agriculture, positive value chain, and positive choices in our products. 
So our fleet really falls under that positive value chain piece. And we've got some pretty aggressive carbon reduction goals. So as we look towards our net zero target by 2040 of reducing the emissions associated with our operations, specifically our private fleet, we've looked at a suite of solutions. So we've done a lot with electrification in the field. We've, we've, we run one of the largest over the road natural gas fleets, which is primarily powered by renewable natural gas. And we were looking for other solutions to make meaningful impact as we go on this journey. And so we came upon both renewable diesel and biodiesel as solutions that we could incorporate into our fleet of diesel tractors today and start making progress towards those goals. Now, uh, with your in your fleet, I don't know how many vehicles you have, but is this across the board or are you just still working into it? That's a great question. So we have one of the largest private fleets here in North America, a little over 80,000 total assets. For us, we've really targeted biofuels and renew renewable and alternative fuels in our over-the-road business. So some of the equipment that uses the most fuel in our operations has the largest emissions impact. Um, one thing we've tried to focus in on is progress over perfection. And being able to switch over those trucks today to run on a biogenic fuel helps us start to make that meaningful progress. Um, when we look at some of our more last mile direct store delivery type operations, electrification for us fits really well. So we are spending a lot of time with that solution there. But it's these long distance over the road routes that are hard to electrify, hard to decarbonize, where we might go from Kansas to the Canadian border, down to the Mexican border and back. These are really difficult places where there's not a lot of infrastructure, very challenging duty cycles. And this is where we've been able to incorporate biofuels and really start to make meaningful progress towards those goals. We have a lot of soybean growers here. I, and when, so when they come by, what kind of questions are they asking? They, they probably are going, wondering just exactly what you guys are doing, right? Yeah. Well, it's great. I mean, part of the draw is we have a lot of hydration here for them and snacks, so it helps draw the people in. And then we've got this beautiful biodiesel truck here, which just catches people's eye, draws in, and then they immediately have questions and want to know about it. So today, especially, we've seen a lot of traffic coming in, people asking a lot of you know very detailed, good questions about how the truck works, and then that gives us an opportunity to talk about you know, where this fits into our strategy how it supports farmers, because a lot of the fuel stock comes from soybean oil, corn oil, so it's been great today, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I would not doubt that there are farmers that maybe aren't using biodiesel themselves. Maybe this uh, gives them some ideas. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we talked to, to a few folks today who, you know, they wanted to go back 20 years and their experience with biodiesel initially was not good. And so they've not used it since. And you know, Adam and we have one of our drivers here too, Brian, have just been great about talking about how the quality of the fuel has increased. And, you know, when you talk to a driver like Brian who does 600 miles a day on a truck like the one we have here, I mean, that's a pretty good proof point for folks to know that this is a solution that can work. Well, um, where, do, where do you go from here? So where do we go from here? We're continuing to incorporate low carbon solutions across our fleet. Uh, today we have about 100 trucks here in the U.S. operating on B99 up to B100. Uh, we've upfit a couple hundred additional trucks beyond that with a solution from Optimus Technologies, which allows us to run on up to B100. So we're continuing to, to grow the number of diesel tractors that we have in our fleet that are equipped with this system. And as we continue to deploy um, fuel at our locations for B99 and B100, we can t continue to convert more of those traditional petroleum gallons over. We're also looking for opportunities to bring this to retail. So not only can our fleet benefit from it, but a lot of our third parties we rely on to move goods throughout our supply chain can also take advantage of some of those same benefits. Well, before we close, anything else either one of you might want to say we didn't touch on? Well, I, I can just say, you know, a big thank you to everybody that's come by the booth today and for the Farm Progress team for being so great about welcoming us, welcoming us in. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard from multiple people come up to me and say, we don't think we've ever seen a food and beverage company show up at Farm Progress before. You know, we had Governor Reynolds here yesterday, stopped by the booth. We talked for, with her for about 10, 15 minutes, said the same thing and just said, you know, we need more folks on that end of the value chain showing up at places like this. We need to make the connection. So as much as anything else, we're really here to say we're a part of that value chain. We support the what we call the first mile of that value chain, our farmers, and really want to make sure people understand everything we're doing. 
right. Well, thank you guys very much, Adam and Dan. Uh, we are here at the Farm Progress Show. I'm Chuck Zimmerman reporting. This is the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. We will return in just a moment with more agriculture news. This segment is brought to you by Live Earth Products. To get to know a little more about Live Earth Products, we're talking on the phone today with Vice President Russell Taylor. For the Conservationist of the Year, what goals would you like to see occur this year? So this is continuing work as the Certified Crop Advisor Conservationist of the Year. They're looking for uh, certified crop advisors who are trying to aid farmers in getting information or conservation practices. One thing we've identified that is keeping farmers from getting conservation practices is actually just information and products. The current federal regulations actually were written in the 1950s. And at that time, those rules were only restricting fertilizers and pesticides. They didn't put into account other developing technologies such as plant biostimulants and some of these newer technologies we're using in agriculture. And so for 2024, our goal is to really help change the laws that are impacting biostimulant regulation to allow them to be used and treated as a fertilizer, not as a pesticide. So what does that process look like to go through that and get that change to be where it needs to be? Well, it's actually, there's a very long on-ramp. We've been working on this since 2014. And the bricks that we've laid uh, on this path are now being hopefully being included in the farm bill. So more than anything now, it's just supporting the work we've already done, trying to get legislators aware of the problem and, and hopefully enact those rules. There's an act right now by California regulators that's called the uh, Plant Biostimulant Act. And so the best thing that farmers can do is call up and say, hey, we support this language. This is going to give us more tools to enact those conservation practices and have more products available to us. To get to know more about Live Earth products, you can visit them online at liveearth.com. That is spelled L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the Public Lands Council are giving strong support to the Endangered Species Act Amendment Act of 2024. It was introduced by Representative Dan Newhouse of Washington and Representative Bruce Westerman of Arkansas. The legislation would reform the Endangered Species Act and provide more timely conservation efforts on America's rangeland. PLC Executive Director and NCBA Executive Director of Government Affairs, Caitlin Glover, joins us today to look further into the issue. All right. And we were going to talk today uh, about the ESA Amendments Act, and I wanted to get some reaction about it and see, you know, how NCBA and PLC um, are feeling about the act and where you think it should go from here. To start us out, would you explain to my listeners what this is? Sure. So the Endangered Species Act Amendments uh, Act is a bill that is uh, seeking, like many before it, to fix some of the really pivotal problems with the Endangered Species Act. Uh, for a very long time, the Endangered Species Act has been held up as as sort of the, the ultimate protection for species for plants, for animals that are imperiled and need of additional help, additional resources to make sure that they don't go extinct. That was the original intent of the bill. And, and unfortunately, over time, the Endangered Species Act uh, was, was changed. Things were sort of chipped away at the edges. Small tweaks were made um, and, and really just didn't keep up with times. And so what we see now is, is a law that while the intent is still to protect species from extinction, it's almost like you put them in this perpetual status uh, of, of being listed but not being recovered. Um, and and the, the problem with that is that you have a huge drain on taxpayer dollars, you have a huge regulatory burden, um, you really have no off-ramp for success stories, um, and, and it, it really just creates this, this really controversial scenario. So the ESA Amendments Act um, is trying to fix number of those things. We're, we're hugely thankful to Chairman Westerman uh, of the House Natural Resources Committee and some of his colleagues uh, like uh, uh, Chairman Pete Stauber from Minnesota of, of the Wildlife Subcommittee um, and others who were, were really, really quite uh, pivotal in introducing this bill after um, a number of years of work to, to make some of these changes. I really liked that you talked about the intent of the um, Endangered Species Act. 
uh, because intent is one thing, but then after 50 years, it has almost a different effect on things. And so is this kind of putting it back into, you know, making a correction in its path? That's exactly right, Sabrina. I mean, I think there there are some significant changes that are needed um, really to get back to the implementation of, of that early intent. Um, and like with so many things, the, the intent may be honorable, but execution uh, is really all that matters. One of the things that we've seen with the Endangered Species Act over time is that it was much easier to list species. It was much easier to place um, th place mechanisms in place to, to put them on an imperiled species list. But it was very, very difficult to actually do the work to conserve those species. It was very difficult to draw lines on a map about where priority areas were. And it was even more difficult to remove those species. You know, we talk a lot in the West about those iconic species like bears and wolves uh, that have been off the list and on the list and off the list and on the list again um, over the, you know, the last several decades. But this is true for so many species around the country. The ESA Amendments Act um, deals with this through, through a couple different things. One of the problems with ESA is the regulatory burdens. The work that private landowners do isn't rewarded, it's not counted, and, and what they end up seeing is that it's it's not a benefit to have these special imperiled rare species. Um, it, it's a burden and it's a drain on their resources and their drain on their ability to be good stewards of the land. And so one of the things this bill does is that it incentivizes that wildlife conservation on private lands, makes sure that it's going to count as part of that larger conservation effort, and protects those landowners from additional uh, regulatory burdens uh, if a species is is um, it comes under further protection. The other really key thing that it does, uh, and this bill does a lot of things, but one thing I want to mention today um, is that it requires that the removal of a species from a from the endangered species list that that removal, that recognition of success isn't subject to judicial review. The biggest problem, I think, frankly, over, over the years and the biggest drain on ESA resources is that there have been groups who fundraise, who have, have created their own identities um, around this sue and settle around endangered species. Uh, they see a species coming off the list. They, they gin up a very emotional response uh, around uh, ESA listings and and make claims that if you remove a species from the list, then automatically they'll go extinct. Things that just aren't true, but but are, are garner a lot of emotion and, and are effective fundraising tools. And they use those fundraising efforts to sue the agency in court. And so the, then the Fish and Wildlife Service has to spend money defending themselves, defending their process, defending the science, um, and, and where that money could be better spent on actual species conservation. And so, you know, while judicial review is, is an important tool in many, many cases, the ESA has been absolutely weaponized um, because of the role of the courts here. And there are so many places in the underlying Endangered Species Act that's, that are safeguards to make sure that species are delisted properly. Um, and this bill supports those. And so really, when, when we're thinking about the future of the ESA, this bill very rightly adjusts uh, whether you can you can challenge a delisting in court. So both of those things are, are really great news. Right. And, you know, I wanted to ask about delisting an animal because uh, I'm obviously I'm not the expert on this. You are. But it it seems to me that once an animal has been put on the list, uh, it's nearly impossible sometimes to actually get that taken off, no matter, as you said, the success in uh, that you know that we've seen with the animal um will this make that better just you know will it make it easier all the way around to actually like you said um you know acknowledge the successes that we've seen with the ESA it, it will make it easier to acknowledge the success it will also make it easier to get to a point where where the agency is successful so when a species listed, uh, they they should go through this recovery planning period. The agency, you know, is is supposed to make a plan to figure out how to to get this species off the list. That's the ultimate goal, right? Because if you can delist a species, it it, it should be um, it should be recovered. It should no longer need protection. So the bill makes some investments uh, in uh, not only the agency's appropriations, but also in uh, state partnerships, because states do have uh, the responsibility to manage a lot of land and a lot of other wildlife. 
And so it empowers uh, and provides additional resources during that recovery period. It, it, it makes it really clear um, how to, to meet those metric, metrics of success. And then when you get to the delisting stage, it provides a lot more certainty to be able to get animals and plants off the list. Getting species listed is the easy part. The hard part is, is recovery. The harder part is delisting. And sometimes even the hardest part of all is, is protecting that delisting um, from litigation. And this bill um, it does a really nice job of addressing all four parts of, of, that, of that recovery arc. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. We are chatting today with Caitlin Glover, who is the Public Lands Council Executive Director and National Cattlemen's Beef Association Executive Director of Government Affairs. And we're talking about the Endangered Species Act Amendments Act of 2024. Yeah. And then has there been a lot of traction with this bill? Is it getting much support that you've seen? So, so the, the bill is widely supported by a lot of us who have been engaged in this ESA conversation for a very long time. Um, but as, as you and I both know, unfortunately, there bills like this are an uphill battle. Um, we have seen several efforts over the last 10 years, the last 20 years, frankly, um, that have tried to bring some common sense, that have tried to bring some, some normalcy and, and sort of realism to the Endangered Species Act process. Um, and the forces that that use the kind of litigation, that use the, the, the fundraising for sort of chaos uh, in the ESA process itself, those are the ones who are also opposing a bill like this. What they don't want to see is an ESA process that works better. Um, they want to see species protected under this restrictive statute rather than managed in a way that's best for the species and for the landscape. And so there certainly are detractors, Sabrina. Um, but but I'll tell you that you know those detractors are are very much motivated uh, by by you know what what has always motivated them. They want to be able to fundraise to litigate. They want to see species off the list. They don't want states to manage wildlife. Um, and they don't want the kind of, you know, responsible stewardship across these these landscapes um, that really, you know, makes landscapes healthy, makes wildlife healthy, and, and makes, you know, the land and the people able to work together. Yeah. Yes. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a few months away from hitting 50 years old. And I remember as a young teenager in California, dealing with, uh, you know, listening to reports about the Endangered Species Act and how things were not being, I want to say, wisely handled um, at that time, even. And that's been, like I said, I'm almost 50. And this is, so that's been many, many years. Uh, do you think that we will actually get a fix? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say no to that, Sabrina, right? Um, hope, right, hope. Keep yeah, hoping. I, I hope, I, I, I do hope. Um, you know, everything in Congress comes down to math, right? Um, the, the math about whether we can get something across the finish line. Sometimes really good bills don't get across the finish line. I will tell you that I'm really hopeful with this bill for a number of reasons. Um, I do think that these that this bill uh, is is a, a really great piece of legislation. I think it is is one that recognizes the the key problems. Um, it recognizes the biggest pinch points. Um, and I am hopeful, as I'm always hopeful, right? That that um, that that common sense will win out. Sometimes that's an uphill battle uh, with Congress. <laughs> Sometimes that's uh, an uphill battle um, in these very emotional issues like this. Um, but I think that this bill is well poised to move. Um, you know, and, and if it's not, you know, in an end of the year package, right, when we're thinking about what we want to do for the future, um, certainly this bill and its supporters, uh, because of its supporters, are really well poised to, to continue this fight um, into next year and, and in a new Congress. All right. Is there anything else that you think that my listeners need to know um, about this bill or about the ESA, um, or maybe if they're looking for something, a way that they can have their voices heard, what can they do? So I think one of the really interesting things about the Endangered Species Act is that it touches everybody. It's 
you know, we, we, we saw a study a few years ago that 99% of counties uh, in the United States had some endangered species, whether it was a plant or whether it was an animal um, or, or whether, you know, it was some sort of amoeba in, you know, in a pond somewhere, right? Um, you, you see a, a widespread impact. And so for, for everybody who is impacted, for everybody who sees um, the, the need to improve species conservation to make it work better, sort of all the way around, um, you have the ability to, to contact your member of Congress, uh, find your members of the House of Representatives, tell them to co-sponsor, tell them to support this Endangered Species Act Amendments Act, uh, tell them to talk to, to Representative Westerman, um, to Mr. Stauber, Mr. Tiffany, um, and, and all of the different members who, who are currently co-sponsors. Um, moving this forward is really, really important. And it's really important to show that, you know, it's, it is really important in the West, but it's not just a Western issue. It's not just an East Coast issue. It's, it's an everywhere issue. Thank you once again to Caitlin Glover. That's today's Top Agriculture News. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halvertson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.